So we're in Esther chapter 3. If you found that chapter, I'd like to just briefly pause in prayer as we uh, then will begin in looking into God's Word. <clears throat> Our Father, the Lord Jesus told us that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And Father, we confess this morning we come hungry for you to feed us. Like baby birds in a nest, our mouths are open. We ask that you'd feed us. May the truth of your word enrich us and strengthen us and nourish even the deepest parts of our heart and that our eyes and hearts will be fixed upon your son, Jesus. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Every story has a good guy and a bad guy. Literary scholars refer to these as the protagonist and the antagonist. Superman swapped blows with Lex Luthor. Harry Potter clashed with Voldemort. And my apologies for naming him. <clears throat> and of course, the, the greatest good guy versus bad guy drama of all time, the roadrunner had Wile E. Coyote. <laughs> if you think about it, it's true. Every, every kind of story out there, whether it's a novel or a cartoon or a movie, every story has a good guy and a bad guy. And the story of Esther is no exception. As we come this morning to Esther chapter 3, we meet the bad guy. And, and trust me when I tell you, he is a bad guy. Take, if you will, the, the money of a multimillionaire, the, the influence of a, of a president the emotional stability of a toddler, and the, 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 the blood thirstiness of a serial killer, and you begin to get a picture of just how bad this bad guy is. But as we meet this bad guy this morning, and as I hope to show you, his role in this story, and his role in really in the, the place of Scripture, his role is much more than just the antagonist. He's more than just the, 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 the arch nemesis. He's more than just the villain of the story. Who he is and what he does stands for us today as a historical reminder that evil is a problem in our world. Evil is a problem. It was a problem in the days of Esther and Mordecai, and it stands as a problem today. Now, you remember the, the theme of this book of Esther. It's a, it's a theological idea, a word called providence. Providence, we define the first week, is, is God has prevision, and therefore, in light of his prevision, he makes provision. He, he declares the ends from the beginning, and because of God's omniscience, His knowledge and His prevision, He's able to then guide the, 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 the track of human history for His purposes. And so that's His providence. The, the series titled, God Works Behind the Scene. Whether we see it or not, whether we know it or not, God is working. But even that theme, that theme begs a question. And the question is, why does God have to act providentially in the first place? Why is it that, that God has to get involved in human affairs anyway? You ever heard the old cliche that with every cloud, there's a silver lining? If the silver lining of the book of Esther is the providence of God, the dark, ominous storm cloud of the book of Esther is human malevolence. Providence exists 
because malevolence also exists. The, the, the reason God has to, the reason heaven has to get involved from time to time is because earth is a mess. Earth is a wreck. And because of the malevolence in our world, God has to then act in providence to accomplish His purposes. And, and, and planet earth has been a mess all the way since the Garden of Eden. I was curious about it this week. I was, I, I did something I've, I, I don't know that I've done in probably years. I went yesterday and bought a newspaper. I'm one of these young people. I get all my news from the internet, so I don't normally read the printed paper. But I bought a, a Lynchburg news in advance. And I sat down and I thought, I'm just curious. And so I began flipping through and I, and I saw there were stories of local news and stories, of course, of national news. And I just began making a list of all the, the stories that were there. And there were stories about kidnappings, stories about murder, stories about espionage and abuse, stories about uh, fraud, stories about adultery. And that was just section A. I mean, we don't have to look very far to realize that evil is a problem. It was a problem in the Garden of Eden and it continues to be a problem today. And in Esther chapter 3, the problem of evil rears its ugly head. And what we, what we see though in this story, what is so precious, what is so wonderful in, in Esther chapter 3 and this, this book as a whole, is that we are reminded that God even works despite the problem of evil. The problem of evil is there and we encounter it day after day, week after week, and yet we are assured in the book of Esther that God in His providence is working behind the scene to accomplish His good pleasure. And in this chapter of Esther chapter 3, we made an evil man who has evil plans to do evil things, and yet we are reminded that behind it all, there stands an evil one who would love nothing more than to wreak havoc, to bring wickedness and unrighteousness in our world and in our own lives. So so this chapter sits, while it's pivotal to this story, it's also a faint echo of the whole Bible and, and what we experience day to day, week after week, that evil is present and that evil is a problem. And there's two specific areas that Esther chapter 3 reveals to us where, where, where evil is a problem. Two areas where evil is a problem. Area number one. We, we see in these opening verses here that historically, unrestrained evil only intensifies. Historically, unrestrained evil only intensifies. So let's see this in the first few verses of chapter 3. It begins chapter 3, verse 1. After these events... Now just pause there. Some of you are visiting today and you don't know what these events are, so let me quickly get you caught up to speed. We're in about 400 B.C. We're we're in uh, a a region, it's the the, the empire of the Medo-Persians. The king is a man by the name of Ahasuerus, also known as Xerxes. Xerxes, in chapter 1, decided to divorce his wife and to begin to look for a new one. So he decides to have this this ancient version of the bachelor. They bring all these single women around and they kind of march them through and each one has a night with the king. And as a result, he decides to choose the next queen. Among those women, which by the way, I don't think I said this last week, Herodotus, a Greek historian, tells us there was 400 women that were a part of this. One of those 400 women was a a lady by the name of Esther. She was a Jew. Her name was also Hadassah, who was being raised by her uncle Mordecai. Esther has her night with the king, and time passes, and she is selected to to become the next queen of, of, of Ahasuerus. Now, you would think that's how the chapter would end, but there's one other little tiny story that the chapter ends. It says that that the Mordecai found out about an assassination plot. There was two men, Big Than and Teresh. 
Big Than, you may not have seen, he was mentioned in chapter 1 as one of the king's eunuchs. Now maybe I'm reading too much into this, but uh, if the king had made me a eunuch, I probably would want to assassinate him too. <laughs> um, I think we can find the motive very easily in that passage, you know. The Oxford definition of a, a eunuch is somebody who used to be happy. So um, this... Um, These guys are disgruntled for some reason. So they make this plot to overthrow, to to kill the king. And they 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 uh, it becomes known to Mordecai, and so Mordecai, through back channels, lets Esther, the queen, know. Esther tells her husband, he investigates it. There's this whole congressional hearing, it's found out to be true. And the two men, Teresh and Big Than, are executed. And the way the chapter ends, it kind of ends disappointingly because this guy Mordecai, he risked his life. He went out of his way to, to, un, to, to uncover this plot, to foil it. And what does he get? He gets nothing but a lousy footnote in the king's journal. Which, by the way, is going to become significant later. But he gets this footnote in the journal. And so now chapter 3, verse 1 says, After these events, King Ahasuerus promoted, it's got to be Mordecai, right? I mean, Mordecai was the guy who just risked his life. Mordecai was the guy, if anybody deserves a promotion, it's this guy. But what does it say? King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the son of Hamadatha the Agagite, and advanced him and established his authority over all the princes who were with him. Now notice what happens from there. It says verse 2, All the king's servants who were at the king's gate, bowed down and paid homage to Haman, for so the king had commanded concerning him. But Mordecai neither bowed down nor paid homage. Then the king's servants who were at the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why are you transgressing the king's command? Now it was when they had spoken daily to him that he would not listen to them, that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's reason would stand, for he had told them he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai neither bowed nor paid homage to him, Haman was filled with rage. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had told him who the people of Mordecai were. Therefore, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, who were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. So now we get to the crux of the issue. Now we get to the problem of the book of Esther. Everything up to this point has been introductory, getting us ready for this moment. And everything begins to, to, to unravel at this point because of one simple incident. This man gets promoted by the name of Haman, and every day on his way to work, as Haman walks down the streets, there are other servants of the king who stand there and say, Good morning, Haman, sir. How are you, sir? Good morning, sir. How was your, your night last night? Good morning, sir. Do you need a cup of coffee? Good morning, sir. What can I do for you? And everyone saluted him and bowed to him. Everyone showed him the respect and the deference that he deserved. Except for one person. Mordecai. Mordecai, it says in verse 2, he neither bowed nor paid homage. Everybody else was saluting and Mordecai just stood there, kind of defiantly. Now, it, it, it's interesting. In fact, there's a, there's a great play on words in verse 4. It says there in the middle of it, they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's reason would stand. Do you see the play on words there? You can see it in English, like in Hebrew. Every time Haman walked by, Mordecai stood up, and now they want to see if his excuse will also stand up. Will it also hold weight in this discussion? So he says there, what's the reason that he won't bow? It says in verse 4, because he was a Jew. So now he tells everyone. Remember previously he wouldn't tell anybody? He and Esther hid it the whole time. Well, now it becomes a matter of principle. And so he he says, no, we are Jews. That's why I will not bow. That's why I will not do this. So what's the problem here? Do Jews not bow to those in authority? Do they not give respect, deference to those who deserve it? What is going on here? Well, there's what's happening here, it's really, really subtle. In fact, I had a church member who, who emailed me this week and said, Pastor, he said, I've been reading this chapter all week. Why would Mordecai not bow? And I said, I appreciate your question. Come Sunday at 11 o'clock and I'll tell you. you know. uh, no. uh, I wasn't that cruel. Um, 
But it's, it's, you can easily overlook it and not see the reason. It's very, very subtle. The issue has something to do with Mordecai's Jewishness. So let's go back now to verse 1 and see who this, this guy is. It speaks here that he is, he is named Haman. If I was making this into a movie, when you get to verse 1 and it names him as Haman, that's the point at which you would start to hear the Imperial March, you know, from Star Wars. Bum, bum, bum. Like this is the bad guy entering the scene. In fact, he, he, he is so hated to this day, I'm not making this up, to this day, if you go to a Jewish synagogue on Purim, they will read this whole story. And every time he's mentioned, he appears 53 times in the book, every time the name Haman is read, the entire audience starts booing and hissing and jeering to try and drown out his name. He is so hated and despised for what he does. So it says here his name is Haman, but there's, there's more to it than this. It says he is Haman, uh, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite. Now, you know the Bible throws in these like genealogical tidbits that we just blow past sometimes and don't give any attention to. But this is one of those details that is incredibly significant to what's happening. Take a step back with me in time, back to um, Israel's past when they came out of Egypt. They came out of Egypt and they began wandering through the wilderness. And as they were wandering through the wilderness, there was one point when this, this people group, this tribe began attacking them just unprovoked started harassing them and started coming after the Israelites and the name of that tribe was the Amalekites. You remember that battle? That was the one where Moses went and as long as his hands were up, they were winning. But as soon as they went down, they started to lose. So Joshua, they stood there and helped prop up his arms so that they would win. And at every turn, the Amalekites, it's like they were there just sort of provoking them and picking on them. They were like the constant bully on the playground. And so the Israelites, they suffered long with the Amalekites constantly plaguing them. In fact, in the book of Exodus, God says to Moses after that battle, He said to them that Yahweh will war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. That was the start of a long trail of these these wars between them. And so you, you get to the time of Deuteronomy. They're about to go in the promised land. And Joshua is told in the book of Deuteronomy, when you go into Canaan, you need to wipe out the Amalekites. Along with the others, but you particularly need to wipe out the Amalekites. Because they, for generations after generations, they have brought evil and brought wickedness uh, against my people. And so God's defending them and says that you are to to get rid of them. But what do they do? You ever read Judges chapter 2? They didn't do it. They decided that partial obedience was okay. We'll do some of what God says. We don't want to do all of it. So the judges, as they came into promise, they didn't do what they were supposed to do. And so Israel goes through this cycle. So you get past the time of the judges, then you get to the time of the kings. And the first king of Israel was a man by the name of Saul. And you remember Saul on one occasion was told to go out and fight the Amalekites. And he was told, all right, now you get rid of them. Once and for all, destroy them. Leave nothing, not even sheep, cattle, nothing to plunder. You have been fighting them for too long. They've harassed you for too long. Get rid of the Amalekites. And so what happens? Saul did some of it, like the time of the judge, but he didn't do all of it. And Samuel, the, the prophet, he, he shows up and he, he, he looks at Saul and he stops and he says, what is that I hear in the distance? I can hear a cow mooing and he has the accent of an Amalekite. <laughs> that sheep is bleeding. That's a distinctly Amalekite, you know, sheep. And who's that man that you've got your foot on his neck right there? Who is this guy and why is he still alive? He was the king of the Amalekites. And his name was King Agag. And from that time forward, the descendants became known, instead of as Amalekites, now they were known as Agagites. And here this man Hammon, son of Hamadatha, is himself an Agagite. Now, it's really interesting. At this point, this is where where he would have realized, Mordecai would have realized, this guy is bad news. He's one of our long-term enemies. This family feud's been going on for a long period of time. But there's even more to it than this. 
If you look back in chapter 2, you remember Mordecai, how he was introduced to us, chapter 2, verse 5? It says, Now there was at the citadel in Susa a Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shemai, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. So one of, of Mordecai's ancestors was Kish. Well, Kish is also the name of Saul's father. Now, it's, we were discussing this after the service. It's probably not the same Kish, unless they've left out some names, which sometimes they did. We know genealogies are incomplete in places. But if nothing else, it's a family name, and he's, the, the author's connecting us, saying, this guy comes from Agag, and this guy comes from Kish, and, and they too have basically inherited this royal rumble, this, this, this lifelong generational battle between these two groups. And it now comes down to a descendant of Agag, and a descendant of Kish, who was also a descendant of Saul, and now they are going to have it out. See, now do you see why Mordecai is hesitant to bow? I'm not saying it's right or wrong. You can discuss it over lunch because the king did order it. But what happened was they were introducing him. They they said, "Uh, we want to tell all the servants this is the king's new right-hand man. Uh, His his name is Haman. And Mordecai would have said, oh, okay, no problem with that. He's Haman, the son of Hamadatha. Oh, okay. He's Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite. And Mordecai went and went, er, what? An Agagite? I thought these guys were dead. I thought these guys were gone. We were supposed to have wiped them out in times past, but the judges didn't do it, and his distant ancestor Saul did not do it, and now Mordecai has inherited the mantle of this this huge battle. This now conflict is going on, but do you see... The evil was not restrained over history, and so now it has intensified. Because the judges didn't do their job, and because Saul didn't do his job, now Mordecai and Esther have to clean up the mess. The the evil has only gotten worse and gotten more powerful in time. It's like in your home, if 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 you discover that you've got cockroaches, you don't just go, well, there's just one or two of them. Does anybody say that, you know? You hear, you see evidence of a mouse. Well, there may just be a few. It's no big deal. We'll just, we'll just tolerate them. What happens? If you don't restrain it, if you don't stop it, it's, it's only going to multiply. It's only going to get worse. And that's what God had warned the Israelites in days past. And they ignored God's word. And we see here that this evil went unrestrained and now it has only intensified. Now you say, all right, so what? What does it have to do with us? We don't have a mandate to go kill Amalekites, do we? No, we don't. But we are reminded here of something really that's, that's significant, not so much the life of the church, but, but it addresses an issue outside of the church. The, the, the church doesn't have this responsibility, but listen, in Romans chapter 13, God did, did give a, a civic duty to the government, and Romans 13 says that the government, as a minister of God, has been given a sharp two-edged sword to wield against those who practice evil. This is why we need a prison system. This is why we should pray for our law enforcement officers. This is why we should lift up our military to the Lord. Because they have a task, whether they're Christians or not, a task given by God, because evil needs to be restrained. And and if, if there is no restraining of evil, it only gets worse in time. I know that every time our, our own country enters into a, a new skirmish somewhere around the world, there's always those who have a discussion, well, you know, we don't need to be the world's police. We don't need to always be sticking our nose in other people's business. Let those other countries, let them sort it out, let them do that. And certainly every situation is different, and probably there's differing opinions, even our own congregation, of what diplomacy and and military activity look like. But but, but regardless, the bottom line is that, that God has given that responsibility to governments to restrain evil, and if that evil is not restrained, if it's not taken care of, over time it will only get worse. Yes, there's a kind of war that is very unjust, but there is a kind of war that is just, ordained even by God as an act to restrain the evildoers of society. Israel didn't do it. 
The judges didn't do it. Saul didn't do it. And now it falls upon their shoulders. If, if, if Saul, the immediate ancestor of Kish, had done his job, then Esther, the, the distant ancestor of Kish, would not have had to stick out her neck in this situation. Because the Amalekites weren't taken care of when they should have been, when Israel had the opportunity, because the evil and wickedness of these people was allowed to be tolerated, we've now gotten to a point where the Amalekites, where at one point they, they simply talked about harassing the Jews, at one point they were just sort of annoying the Jews, at one point they were just sort of bothering the Jews, now they are in a position to talk about exterminating the Jews. That's his plan. And because the, they didn't do it in the past to restrain the evil, now this Agagite, this Amalekite, finds himself in a key position to be able to carry out his plan to destroy Israel once and for all. There was a point in World War II when the president said that we have no desire no need to send our boys into war, into a European war. And then evil continued to spiral outward and it wasn't taken care of. So guess what? We had to get involved. If, if, if evil is not restrained, even in the civic, even in the municipal, even in the, the legislative sense, a community, a state, a nation, a society will only reduce into anarchy and mayhem and evil will intensify. There needs to be order in society. And this is why we pray for our leaders. This is why we pray for our president. This is why we pray for those that are, that are in governing authority because they have a task given by God to restrain evildoers. And we'd be much worse off if they weren't doing their job. So we see this first area, that unrestrained evil, it only intensifies historically. Now you say, okay, great, that's wonderful. Thanks for the history lesson. But what does it have to do with me? Well, what it has to do with you is this. What has happened in this passage and over time, what has happened historically is now going to happen, you're going to see it happen personally in Haman. So the second area where we see this is that not only historically does unrestrained evil intensify, but we're also going to see now that personally unrestrained evil will also intensify. The, the author draws our attention to this big, long battle between genealogies and these two groups at the very beginning. And then he zeroes in on this man, Haman, and he begins to expose his heart, and he shows what's happening in Haman's own heart and his own life, and we begin to see how this evil grows like a cancer inside of him. It started in verse 5, where it says that he was filled with rage. Do you know why people get angry? Um, James tells us that we get angry because of selfishness or what we call pride. It, it comes to us from a sense that I'm entitled to something. This is my lane of traffic. A guy cuts me off. How dare you? This is my lane. Somebody speaks to you ill at customer service. Do you know who I am? And we feel entitled to their respect, to this lane, to whatever it is. And so when we, when we feel that entitlement threatened, then our selfishness comes out and it results in this volcanic eruption of anger. And here it, it, it spills over into rage. So it starts here with, with pride in his heart and that pride then gives way to anger. The evil doesn't get restrained here. He should have taken care of it here with the pride, but it now moves over into this, this arena of anger and rage. And then he says in verse 6, he explains his plan, which is to destroy all the Jews. Now, instead of taking his anger out on one guy, which is who he's mad at, Mordecai, what does he do? He starts stereotyping all the Jews. And he starts lumping them all into his plans for revenge. And he now moves from pride into anger, and his anger now gives way to this desire for revenge. He wants to get back, not just at him, he wants to, to upset all of them. He wants to get even with the whole group. 
He probably knows this, this lifelong battle and he's in a strategic position to, to take care of them once and for all. So his pride gives way to anger. His anger gives way to revenge and this kind of uh, murder. Then verse 7, notice in the first month, which is the month Nisan in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, poor, that is the lot, was cast before Haman from day to day and from month to month until the twelfth month, that is the month Adar. This is where the name, by the way, of the holiday, this book is about the origins of Purim, Purim, and this is what the word poor means. It means lot, like dice. So, so Haman has this plan that his pride and his anger have led him to, to murder and destroy the Jews. And so every day he wakes up and he takes like the magic eight ball and shakes it up. Should I do it today? Sh- should I do it today? And he casts the lots to tell him when to carry out this plan. So it says in verse 8, Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered and dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of all other peoples, and they do not observe the king's laws, so it is not in the king's interest to let them remain. Now do you see it unraveling even more? We start over here with pride. The pride gives way to anger. It's not restrained there, and so the evil progresses, and now he wants revenge. He wants murder. And then from that, he is now given to lies and deceptions. He, he stereotypes the whole group. None of these Jews, none of them obey. None of them do what they should. They're all guilty of breaking the commands. We just need to get rid of all of them. Well, we know Esther was obedient, even to the things where she disobeyed God's word. She obeyed eating the, the food and in the dress, and she was obedient in the kingdom. And so we come to this point where he's decided now that, that lying and deceiving is going to expedite the process. But he doesn't stop there. Verse 9, if it's pleasing to the king, let it be decreed that they be destroyed. And I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who carry on the king's business to put into the king's treasuries. Then the king took his signet ring from his hand, gave it to Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite. Notice this, the enemy of the Jews. There's no mistaking now what's happening here. Verse 11, the king said to Haman, the silver is yours and the people also to do with them as you please. It's your money, it's your problem. I don't care what you do. You're welcome to kill them, you're welcome to destroy them, fine by me. Again, Ahasuerus is just like, a spineless jellyfish of a leader. Everything people suggest to him, he's like, okay, sure, we'll do that. You know, He makes no decisions on his own. But regardless, he gives him this power, this opportunity. So verse 12, Then the king's scribes were summoned on the 13th day of the month, of the first month, and it was written just as Haman commanded. So they take his commands to the king's satraps, to the governors who were over each province, and to the princes of each people, each province according to its script, each people according to its language, being written in the name of the king of Ahasuerus and sealed with the king's signet ring. If you notice here, they treated the king's decrees like we treat the Bible. They translated them into everybody's language and made sure everybody in the entire kingdom could read it. That the king's decree was law. It was not to be changed. It was final. And so it was, it was basically the word of God. And so they would translate it into everybody's language. They would distribute it then to the furthest reaches of the kingdom. Verse 13, letters were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces. By the way, just a side note there. Um, chapter 8 talks about that these couriers, they ride horses and they, they deliver these messages all throughout the kingdom. They appear more than once. Um, you ever heard of the um, the uh, postal service, their motto, neither rain nor sleet nor day or night or whatever, you know, will stop these couriers from making their delivery? You know where they got that from? They got that from a Greek historian named Herodotus, who I've already mentioned. And Herodotus was explaining this verse. Xerxes invented the postal system. He, he made sure that there were drop-off points throughout the entire kingdom and they had an incredibly efficient way. These horses go that way, you guys go that way. And they would get a message to every single person in the entire kingdom in this incredibly uh, organized fashion. And we've borrowed that statement. This was a, a Greek statement about these specific couriers. But notice what the letter said, that they were there to destroy and to kill and to annihilate all the Jews, both young and old, women and children. Man, do you see that? 
Do you see how this evil, unrestrained is spiraling out of control? It goes from pride. It's not stopped there. It spills over into anger. The anger gives way to a desire for revenge and murder. That gives way to his lies and deceit. And now he has a desire here to to, to take the most innocent among them, little girls playing in the backyard, old men who can't hear the doors broken down by the soldiers, little boys climbing trees, babies in the arms of their mothers. He wants every single one of them to be slaughtered. And then he wants to, to plunder their goods, to take it for themselves and to, to annihilate them. He says there that they will do so on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month Adar, and to seize their possessions as plunder. A copy of the edict to be issued as law in every province was published to all the people so that they should be ready for this day. The couriers went out impelled by the king's command while the decree was issued at the citadel in Susa. Now notice this. And while the king and Haman sat down to drink, the city of Susa was in confusion. This evil personally has gone so far unrestrained in his life, pride give way to anger. Anger gives way to revenge and murder. That gives way to lies and deceit. That gives way to a desire to steal and to plunder and to annihilate others. And now this guy, he is so far in his evil, he he is so desensitized, he he is so calloused, he, he plans this ethnic cleansing, this genocide, and when he gets done, they sit down and pour some scotch and toast each other. Just have a drink. Another hard day's work. It's like it doesn't even phase him. It doesn't even, he's so oblivious to this evil. And it says there that the whole city of Susa was ultimately in confusion. This is why evil needs to be restrained. It, there's, a, there's a responsibility for civic authorities. It, it, historically, there's a responsibility for governments and nations to do it at large. But there is also a need for us to do this personally in our hearts. Because any one of us can walk down the same path here as Haman. We need to guard our hearts. Parents, this is why children need to be disciplined. This is why even back here at the pride issue, we don't just go, well, that's kind of cute. No, it's not cute. We're setting them up for this pattern of, 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 of unresolved evil. This is why churches are called in Scripture to have what's called church discipline. Paul said a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Don't leave it in there. It needs to come out. Because if the evil is not restrained, if it's not taken care of, it's going to influence others. And so he says here, this is a, this is a personal issue. And every one of us has to guard our heart. Now, we get to the end of this and we say the city was in confusion. Everybody was scratching their heads at what was happening. And I think this gives to us a little hint as to what's happening on a larger scale. You know what the New Testament says about confusion? It says God is not the author of confusion. So I wonder who is. If God is not the author of it, whose plan is it to confuse, to bring mayhem, destruction upon others? One of the major themes of this book here that we've already seen is what? God is never mentioned, right? We've already said that. God is never mentioned one time in this book, but there's no doubt about it. Clearly, God, even though he's not mentioned, God is at work. But I would also argue that now one time in this entire book is the devil mentioned by name, but clearly in chapter 3, he is at work. Why do we have providence working? Because there is malevolence also working. If you understand the doctrine of God, but you don't understand the doctrine of the devil, your theology is incomplete. We we need to understand good, but we also need to understand the nature of evil. 
And what we see here in Haman's heart is, is, is you compare it to the New Testament, it is intrinsically connected to, to the work of the devil. The first issue was what? It was an issue of pride where he was offended by what, uh, the, the fact that Mordecai would not bow to him. First Timothy 3 says that, that, that arrogance and pride was the snare of the devil. Pride. It then says that his, his, from, from there he moved into anger. You say, what does anger have to do with it? Ephesians 4 says, be angry and do not sin and do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Why? Because you will give an opportunity for the devil. He then moves over into uh, his desire for to murder. And Jesus said of the devil that he was a murderer from the beginning. His desire to, to, to bring revenge on all these people. Who put it in Judas' heart to betray Jesus? It was the devil. He then moves over into his desire here to, to lie and to deceive to the king. And what does Jesus say in John chapter 8? The devil is a liar and is the father of lies. And then what is the ultimate plan of Haman? It is to take the people, it is to destroy them completely, it is to, to kill them, and it's to plunder their stuff and to steal. And what does John 10.10 10 say? The thief has come that he might steal, kill, and destroy. And so we, we're reminded here that, yes, there's an evil man with evil plans to do evil things, but there is no doubt that behind all of this, there is the evil one who is present in our world. And my friend, he wasn't just present in that day, he is present in our day. That's why the Scripture says the devil, he prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So if our world is filled with evil men and evil thoughts and evil plans and, and working behind it all, orchestrating it in some manner or fashion, is himself the evil one, what is the answer? If the personal problem of evil here is in some form or fashion the, the work, the influence, the temptation of the devil, then what do we need? We need someone who can take care of the evil one. And 1 John 3, 8 says what? That the Son of God has come into the world to destroy the works of the devil. You see, the answer to the problem of evil personally, it's Jesus Christ. The coming of Jesus and the death and resurrection of Jesus, we find out that the works of the devil have been destroyed, the chains and the shackles have been removed. And so Jesus comes and we no longer have to live in pride, but now because of the grace in God, we are men and women of humility. That because of the work of Christ, we no longer have to be given over to, to anger, but we can live peaceably with all men, even loving our enemies and praying for them. Because of the work of Christ, He has destroyed the works of the devil which make us prone to revenge and murder. And instead, we can heap coals of good works upon our enemy's head. Instead of being prone to the works of the devil to lie and deceive, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He calls us to be men and women of truth. And instead of being those prone and tempted to steal, kill, and destroy, it is through the work of Christ, the atonement of Christ, that we don't give ourselves to death but we have been given over to life. Yes, evil is a problem, and it is a problem personally. But the answer to the problem of evil is he who has come to destroy the works of the devil, and that is Jesus Christ. But guess what? That's not our only problem with evil, is it? Jesus is the answer to the problem of evil personally. But we also have this problem that's been going on historically. Year after year, nation after nation, millennia after millennia, we see evil growing in our world, we see it intensifying in our world. So what is the answer to the problem of evil there? Well, Scripture tells us that, that this whole thing began in the Garden of Eden when the, the, the serpent came and the serpent deceived the woman. And there he says there, and he pronounced his judgment, that the, the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, that the two of them would battle. and That the serpent would bruise his heel and, and that ultimately the, the seed of the woman would, would, would prevail in the battle. 
So the Garden of Eden, this problem of evil historically started here. You go all the way to Revelation chapter 12 and guess what has happened there? This little tiny garden snake is now a giant razor tooth sharp dragon. And he is called the serpent of old. And he sits and awaits as a pregnant woman is going to give birth. And he sits waiting in his malice to swallow up the child. But the child is spared by the providence of God. And the child will grow up to do other things. And we are reminded that even though history begins here with the problem of evil in the garden. And even though history is culminating and it's continued to grow with the problem of evil. With the, with the serpent who becomes the dragon. We are reminded that the works of the devil have been destroyed by Christ. And there is coming a day when He will take care of the problem of evil historically. When the clouds will rip open and He will descend with the shout and He will take that serpent of old who is the dragon and will bind Him up and will cast Him forever into the lake of fire and the smoke of His torment will go up forever and ever day and night. And as Romans 16 says, the God of Peace will soon crush Satan beneath your feet. The answer to the problem of evil personally is Jesus. And the answer to the problem of evil historically is also Jesus. Which is why, until that day comes, what is our prayer supposed to be? We pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Because every story has a bad guy. And the story of our universe, the story of history, has an evil one behind it. But every story also has a good guy. And the Lord Jesus Christ is the one who has triumphed over the devil. And in the end, good will prevail over evil. And we pray, deliver us from evil. Let's pray together. Father, we know that this chapter before us is a historical account of an evil man with evil plans. And yet we see unmistakably in light of the rest of Scripture that we have an enemy, we have an accuser of the brethren who is alive and active in our world who would love nothing more than to steal our joy, who would nothing more to to distract us, who would love nothing more than to allow our hearts to be filled with pride and anger and revenge. Oh, Father, forgive us. And may we humble ourselves before you. We thank you that through the death and resurrection of Christ, the problem of evil has been taken care of for us personally. That we no longer have to be prisoners and slaves of sin but we have been set free by the work of Christ. And Father, we look forward to that day when those clouds will open, He will descend with a shout, and He will take care of the problem of evil once and for all. And there will be no more pain, and no more grief, and no more tears, and no more sin, because Your kingdom has come once and for all. Until that day, we pray that You will deliver us from evil. May we be aware of the schemes of the devil to be on our guard, to have our eyes fixed upon Jesus and Him alone. For Your glory and honor, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.